Hi, this is Rich Neapolitan. Today I'm going to be talking about Bayesian network prediction algorithms. The prediction problem concerns trying to find the value of some target variable from some set of other variables which we call the predictors. In supervised learning, we learn the prediction function from data. That is, we know exactly what the target is, we know which variables are supposed to be the predictors, and our only goal is to learn how we map the predictors to the target variable. I'm going to discuss supervised learning using Bayesian networks. However, before that, I should mention there's another type of learning called unsupervised learning, which concerns trying to find hidden structure in data. It concerns the clustering problem, which is as follows. Given the collection of unclassified entities and features of those entities, organize them into categories so we maximize their similarity. A simple example of this would be if you are from some other universe and you show up on Earth and there's a bunch of animals in the pen. I mean, they could be goats, dogs, horses, but you haven't in any way classified them into species, but you can see that they have different heights, different weights, their teeth are different, their hair is different, their, their hoofs or feet are different. So you need, based on these features, you need to cluster them or classify them. If you're good at this, all the goats will be in one group, all the sheep in another, all the dogs in another, the horses in another, and so on. So that's the clustering problem. That's what unsupervised learning is all about. I won't say more about it. I just wanted you to know what it was. Supervised learning is the purpose of this talk. And it's concerned supervised learning using Bayesian networks. And when you do learning or prediction using Bayesian networks, you identify the causes and effects. Other methods don't do that. But since Bayesian networks involve causes and effects, we, we use them in, terms, in those same terms when we do learning. Causes point to the target. This is the target variable, and these are the possible causes. Effects point out of the variable. And they have different independency situations. All right, so that, that is the problem. It's to predict the value of this target based on values of these causes and values of these effects. The simple case is when all predictors are effects and there are no arrows between the predictors. That is, the predictors are independent, conditional, on the target. The network representing this situation is called a naive Bayesian network, and when it's used for classification, it's called a naive Bayesian classifier. What is a naive Bayesian network? Well, it's what I just said. It's a target pointing to a, a bunch of children, and there can be no arrows between the children. In the example we're giving right now, the children are all effects of the target. It's perhaps the simplest type of Bayesian network. That's why it's called a naive Bayesian network. How do you learn a naive Bayesian network? To learn a naive Bayesian network from data, on a set of individuals, we do the following. All right, so we assume we have a, a, a large amount of data on some individuals and some population, and we want to learn the naive Bayesian network where we've already identified the structure. All right, so all we need to do when the structure's already been identified is learn the conditional probability distribution of each effect, EI given T, which can be done simply by counting, and ascertain the prior probability of T in the population which the classifier is going to be used. It can be different in different populations. It could also be learned from the data. It, it depends on, on where the data is from and what population the uh, system will be used in. But once you ascertain the prior probability of the target and these conditional distributions, you have fully specified the naive Bayesian network. How do you do inference with the naive Bayesian network? So after we learn it, what we want to do is do inference for a specific individual X. And now this data X represents data on that particular individual. The probability of the target given the data by Bayes' theorem is probably of data given the target times the probability of the target divided by the probability of the data, which we've just grouped here as this normalizing constant. I'm going with the example that I've shown you before. So in this case, the data is E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and E6. Since in the naive net Bayesian network, these variables are independent conditional on T, this probability is the product of these probabilities. So finally, the probability of T given the data is, is this 
as this uh, form right here. And these are the values that are stored in the, in the network. So all we need to do is, is to retrieve them and we can obtain probably of the target given the data on this particular individual. All right, naive Bayesian networks are the simplest Bayesian network. A, a, a complication uh, of them is called an augmented naive Bayesian network. And it can have arrows between the children. If some of the children are not independent given the target, you can create arrows between them. So here's an example here. E1, E2, and E3 are not mutually independent given the target, so we have arrows between them. E4 and E5 are not independent given the target, so we have arrows between them. So if, they're, if, if it's true that the effects are not independent given the target, a situation like this would more realistically model the joint probability distribution. How do you learn an augmented naive Bayesian network? Well, if we know the edges, and, and, and like I've just shown you, we learn them from the data in the same way that we learn the naive Bayesian network, only they're a little bit more complicated. We need to learn the probability distribution of E1 given T, but we need to learn the probability of E2 given E1 and T, probably E3 given E1, E2 and T, probably E4 given E5, I mean, given E4 and T. So you learn the same kinds of distributions. It's just a little bit more complicated. How do you do inference with an augmented, augmented naive Bayesian network? Well, it's the same uh, situation as naive network. You use Bayes' theorem. This is just like before we get to this point where it's probably of all six conditional on T. But because of these edges, these six are not mutually independent given T. E1, E2, and E3 are independent of E4 and E5, which are and also independent of E6, so we can break this probability into this product. But then we have to do each of these separately. E1, E2, and E3 given T is probably E3 given E1, E2, and T, which is stored in the network. That's one of the probabilities we learned. E2 given E1 and T, E1 given T, E4 and E5 given T is E5 given E4 and T, E4 given T, and then finally we have probability of E6 given T, and finally probability of T. So it's very similar to a naive Bayesian network, but again, just a little bit more complicated. All right, what about causes? Causes pose a much more difficult problem than effects, because we would like to maintain the correct causal structure, and if so, we keep, could, so we represent the probability distribution correctly. Remember, a Bayesian network only represents a joint probability distribution if the conditional independencies amongst the variables are satisfied. So if we wanted to maintain the correct causal structure, we would need a conditional probability distribution of T given every combination of values of the parents. Now, if there's very few of these, that's not hard to do. But if there are only 10 binary parents, we would need about 1 million probability distributions. And we would essentially never have enough data to to obtain that, so it's not really a feasible solution. So what can we do? What have researchers done? The procedure often taken by researchers is simply to invert the causal structure. Make T parents of the causes, because then you can get the distributions easily. You just need the probability of each cause given, given T, which, which is uh, you know, it's as easy as when we do it for effects. But this violates the independence assumptions. Let me review again what these independence assumptions are and show how they are violated. Here is the example, the well-known classical example developed by Uta Pearl at UCLA. Burglars and earthquakes each cause his alarm to go off and they are independent of each other. So the Bayesian network implied by this DAG model is that B and E are independent. But remember, once we know the alarm, they're rendered dependent due to discounting. Once you know your alarm has gone off, you think you've probably been burglarized, but the earthquake explains away the alarm, making it less likely you've been burglarized. Now, if we invert the causal structure, we have the alarm pointing to burglar and earthquake. And this Bayesian network says something quite different as far as the conditional dependencies go. It actually says B and E are dependent. A burglar makes the alarm more likely which somehow, according to this model, makes an earthquake more likely. Once we conditional on the alarm, they're independent, though. 
So this has the exact opposite of the, of the, of the actual conditional independencies and dependencies amongst the variables. So once we do this and ascertain these conditional distributions, the joint probability distribution that we obtain does not really model the joint probability distribution of the variables in nature, which means you can get bad results doing this. Even though, though, we can get bad results and when these independence assumptions are violated, we still often obtain good prediction performance. Here's a bankruptcy prediction problem that was developed in one and it's discussed in two. These are my references. Bankruptcy is caused by these eight variables, um, but, we in, but the researcher inverted the structure like this. The variables are all causal in this problem. One example is Amis, the firm's size. Big firms are less likely to go, go bankrupt. So obviously the firm size has a causal effect on bankruptcy. Bankruptcy does, is not going to affect the, the firm size. Um, I'll, you can look up the other seven variables uh, in, in the references. I won't go over them. But in, in a study done by the researchers in one, the true positive rate for, for this system on, 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 individ, on, on companies outside where the system was learned from was over 80%. And the true negative rate was also over 80%. These are pretty good prediction results. And so we violated the independence assumptions, but still got good results, which is our goal in a prediction algorithm. I mean, we really don't care about being modeling the conditional dependencies exactly. We care about good performance. So if you get good performance, then who cares? But sometimes inverting the causal structure has very poor results. Here's a reference here. Three, they, they evaluated various methods, and the naive Bayesian classifier performed by far the worst of all the methods tested. So there's no simple answer as to what is the best method in a particular situation. It's good to know all the methods and then look at them all when you're doing some particular application. There recently, a, a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh named Gregory Cooper developed a prediction algorithm called Efficient Bayesian Multivariate Classifier, EBMC. This is the reference. And to some extent, it ameliorates this difficulty. It was actually developed to learn a prediction from high dimensional GWAS data sets where you have millions of possible SNPs, I'll talk about SNPs later, that can predict a disease, and you want to find the ones that predict it the best and then do prediction. And the algorithm. Actually, the algorithm divided by the variables can be causes or effects, but in, he actually, in his application, there were causes. And the, I'm going to describe the algorithm starting from the left. It, out of all the possible variables, I'll call them SNPs, since that's what they were, you look over and find the one that has the highest correlation with, with the target. Now, this is done in, in, in his procedure by using the Bayesian score for Bayesian networks. All right, so that's the beginning of your model. Once you do that, you look at all the remaining ones, and you look for the one that increases the score the most. In this example, that, that was S2. So now you point that to the target. He keeps doing greedy forward search, looking for variables that increase the score until no variable increases the score, and then he does greedy backward search. And let's say you end up with S1 and S2. The fact that you found that these two scored high together is indicative of a causal interaction. So what it does next is invert the causal structure and create an arrow between these. Because there's no independencies in this model that aren't in this one. So this model can represent whatever distribution this one represents. So by going from this step to this step, you still represent all the joint distributions of this one, and more, because it doesn't have this independence. But it doesn't matter that it can represent more. The important thing is that it can represent all of them. Then the algorithm continues. It looks for the variable that increases the score the most as a parent. Let's say that's S3. There's greedy and backwards forward search. Let's say it locates S4. Then it inverts their causal structure and creates an arrow between them. You get this model. And finally, um, it keeps doing this until you can't increase the score more. Let's say at this point you can't. This is your final model. So it ends up creating an augmented Bayesian network. 
that does not create all that does not contain all the possible predictors, but only the ones that you found to be the important predictors, or the ones that are appear to be predictors. Right, that's called EBMC. An evaluation of methods. Zhang et al. compared nine prediction methods, including the ones I've just talked about. I am par part of the et al., so when I describe this, I'm going to say we, because I'm, I'm in the we. But before describing it, I want to describe GWAS data sets. Um, then I'll discuss the methods used in the evaluations. What are these nine methods? Finally, I'll provide the results. What is a GWAS? A single nucleotide polymorphism called a SNP, I remember I referred to them earlier, results when a nucleotide that is typically present in the genomic sequence is replaced by another nucleotide. As you know, we have millions of base pairs in our genome. And humans are identical on the vast majority of them, probably 99.9% .9 plus. I think we have 98% of our genome in common with a chimpanzee and 90% in common with, with uh, a mouse. But so with other humans, we are really very similar. SNPs are the places where we're different. To qualify as a SNP, people have, they, you have to, there has to be a difference in, in, in either 1% or 5% of the population, depending upon who you're talking to. There's hundreds of millions of SNPs. The number actually depends upon whether you're talking about a difference of 1% or a difference in 5% of the population. A GWAS involves sampling in a population of individuals up to millions of SNPs. Ordinarily, they're done as case control studies where cases have a disease and controls do not. Then using a GWAS, we try to determine the genetic basis of disease. Now, initially, this might have seemed pretty simple. We just look at each SNP individual, individually and looks for its correlation with the disease. But the situation is a little bit more complicated than that. Here is an example of what I was just talking about. We have millions of SNPs, and maybe these three have a causal effect, none of the others do. In the GYs, we try to discover these three from the data. We search for the causative SNPs. Then we use SNPs to predict disease. All right. Again, it seems simple enough, but epistasis complicates the matter a little bit. Complicating the problem is epistasis. Epistasis is the interaction of two or more loci to affect phenotype when there's little or no marginal effect. It has to do with one gene modifying the behavior of another gene to affect the disease. That's a biological explanation. Statistically, it means that these two have a high correlation with the disease, but each one individually may not have any correlation. And if they have none, that's going to be very, you're not going to find that by looking at each SNP individually. Now you have to look at pairs of SNPs. And if there's a three-SNP epistatic interaction, you may have to look at triplets. Well, in computation, we can't look at all those. So researchers have done a lot of uh, heuristics, have created a lot of heuristic searches to find epistatic-like like interactions. Our goal in the prediction problem is not to find interactions. Well, it is. It's partially to find interactions. It's not to report them. It's to locate them and use them for prediction. So... We looked at 100,000 SNP data sets containing 15 causative SNPs based on five models of epistasis. There were two three SNP interactions, two four SNP interactions. Um, is that correct? Uh, six. There was a five SNP interaction. I <laughs> anyway, there are five interactions. I forgot the exact. They, they range between two and five SNPs, and they added up to 15 causative SNPs. There are 1,000 cases, 1,000 controls. You can look at the, the, the paper that we wrote to see exactly what, what these were. All right. We looked at 10,000 10, SNP data sets containing these same 15 causative SNPs. I remember now, two, three SNPs, one, four SNP, and a five SNP interaction, adding up to um, 15 SNPs. All right. 1,000 um, cases, 1,000 controls. These are sim both simulated data sets. Again, these are simulated. Then we looked at a real late onset Alzheimer's disease low data set containing about 300,000 SNPs through 861 cases, 644 controls. This is a real data set. It's not simulated, so there's no injection of, of, of epistatic interactions. We don't know what the interactions are, and we want to find them and use them to do prediction. What methods did we evaluate? 
Well, the naive bays that we've talked about, EBMC that I just talked about. Uh, this is feature select naive bay and model averaging naive bays. These are two other variations of naive bays, just like MBBMC is. These four are all Bayesian network based methods. Uh, in that sense, they're all similar. They all have uh, the target or the disease at the root. EBMC is, is, is probably the most complicated of, of the four. That's why I discussed that one. We've got logistic regression, lasso. Maybe you should have heard of these uh, from your other studies of, uh, of learning. Support vector machines, which you certainly should have heard, of, heard about. Um, with a linear kernel and also support vector machines with a radial basis function to kernel. I'll discuss these kernels more shortly. And a neural network type program called the extreme learning machines. All right, here's what I was saying about support vector machines. Support vector machines with a linear kernel has a penalty parameter C. And we use this, these different values of C, range from 2 to the minus 5th to 2 to the 15th. Support vector machines with the RBF kernel has, the, has this uh, has a penalty parameter C and also a kernel parameter. We use these values of C, same values, and these values of the kernel parameter, and we did a grid search, meaning we we we, did, we used every value of C with every value of the kernel parameter. And you can have quite different values with support vector machines depending on the parameters used. So whenever you use SVM, you shouldn't just use it. You should use it with a large range of values and see which one gives you the best value and the best results in the best domain, the particular domain. Yeah, extreme learning machines has one parameter number of hidden nodes. We use 10, 500, and 1,000 hidden nodes, neurons in this case. I'm going to show the best results obtained for the method. So I'll show you my results out of all these pos six possibilities will be the best one out of all these uh, cross product possibilities it will be the best one. We analyze the systems using five-fold cross-validation. Here are the average AROCs, areas under the rock curve, for the 100, 1,000 SNP data sets and the 10,000 10, SNP data sets. You can see that these three Bayesian network methods performed quite well with EBMC doing the best. And it's interesting that EBMC did, performs did, did not degrade as you went from 10,000 uh, to 10,000 SNPs. That's an important result because you want the systems to, to work for a large number, as large number of variables as possible. Support vector machine, this LIBS SVM stands for support vector machines with the RBF kernel. That was actually the name of the package that has it. And it has the best results for 1,000 SNPs, about 0.76 or 77, but it degrades and it gets worth, worse with 10,000 SNPs. So as I said before, there's no simple answer. If you're looking for overall robust, robust method, EBMC looks the best, but if, if for a certain number of SNPs, support vector machines look the best. And this is not surprising. Support vector machines in, in, in other states have been shown to be one of, one of the better prediction algorithms. And EBMC is a new algorithm and it's not doing, it's doing pretty well Naive Bayes doesn't do very well with a, with 1,000, but does better with 10,000. Again, Naive Bayes looks at all the variables. Remember, these, this method and these methods, too, find important variables and use those for prediction. So somehow when Naive Bayes looks at all 1,000 of these, it gets better prediction, all 10,000, I mean. Which is, this actually strikes me as odd because there really are supposed to only be 15 predictors, but the results are what they are, and then this is this curious result, actually. When we analyze the real load data set, the three, other than Naive Bayes, the three Bayesian network-based methods performed very well with, actually Man B did a little better than EBMC, but they both did over 70, uh, got AROCs of over 0.7, which is impressive because this means these kind of results, remember what we're predicting here, just based on somebody's genome, we're predicting the risk for Alzheimer's disease and we're getting an AROC of, of over 0.7. You notice LASSO and in particular LIBSVM are not included here. They weren't able to handle this many SNPs. We just couldn't get the, the programs to work. LIBSVM was, was, other than the Bayesian network-based methods, was the method that we would hope would have the best results, but we weren't able to get any results for it. I want to talk a little bit more about EBMC and the load data set. This is the model it learned from the entire 
300,000 plus SNPs. Only three SNPs had predictive value. APOE is known to be the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. This SNP, RS7115850, is on the GOB2 gene. It was found to interact with APOE. This, this substantiates previous results showing GOB2 and APOE do interact to cause load. Then we found that RS6784615 was a predictor all by itself, and there have been studies linking this SNP to load. So these three SNPs all by themselves are what achieved that AROC of, of over 0.7. What's some future research that can be done to analyze these systems more? SVM with the RBF kernel cannot handle the high dimensional GWAS data set. There's an algorithm called Relief F which ranks a set of possible predictor variables in terms of how well they predict the target variable. They use an approach that avoids assuming the predictors are conditionally independent of each other. So in other words, you can use Relief F to take these 300,000 SNPs and find the 30 best predictors or the 100 best predictors. So we can do two-stage prediction, use Relief F to find, identify good predictors, and then use SVM in the second stage to do the prediction. And in this way, we give SVM a number of variables it can handle, and we may get the best performance using this technique. So uh, that the end of this talk and in closing uh, the point I've tried to make by showing you these um, this paper the results of this paper is that there's no simple answer to a best prediction algorithm it's good to have to know them all and when you're doing and you're attacking a problem investigate which one is going to be best for your problem here are the references I mentioned Sun and Chinoy developed the bankruptcy prediction program um, in one of my books I discussed that that problem. That's the second reference. This is the paper concerning uh, showing that in this particular problem concerning online sentiment during a hurricane, the denied Bayes method did very poorly. This is Cooper's uh, paper that, can, that where he introduced EBMC. This is the paper that it's, it's actually under revision right now for Jamia that, that does this comparative analysis. Um, like I said, I'm on it. The Cooper, the, the developer of EBMC is on it. And this is a paper desc describing Relief F, the technique I mentioned at the end of the uh, talk. All right, that's all.